topographic relief carvings are not only really cool things to handle and admire, but they're also surprisingly easy to make with the right software. Today I'll be going over how I made this slice of Arizona using MeshCam and some data freely available online. The data I'm looking for is a grayscale height map. These are images that save elevation information in pixels. You could also acquire elevation data in the form of an STL or 3D model, but those tend to be quite cumbersome to work with, especially as they get more detailed. That means STL data you get off sites like Thingiverse are usually defeatured or have lower spatial resolution. Pixels, on the other hand, are fairly efficient representations of elevation data. The US Geological Survey has a portal where you can download satellite data including grayscale height maps, and it's an excellent resource if you're looking for something specific or really high quality. A quick Google search, however, will reveal some other sites that provide easier and direct access to grayscale images in a familiar projection format. Here, I've saved a crop of one such image. I'll fire up MeshCam and open up this picture. In the import window, I'll say that I want this carved to a size of 5.75 inches across, since the width of my stock is the limiting factor. I know that darker shades represent the lower elevations in my image, and I want the deepest areas to be 0.6 inches deep. My stock is 3 quarters of an inch thick, and I don't want to cut it too thin. In the main interface, I'll adjust my retract height to something small but reasonable, like 3 millimeters. I'll also set my origin to the lower left-hand corner at the top of the model. If you're trying to cut out a very specific region, you might want to set up some machining boundaries to contain your toolpaths so you're not carving regions you don't care about. I'll go to Generate Toolpaths, and here I actually want to handle my roughing and finishing toolpaths separately. So let's focus on roughing first. Eighth inch end mill, 10,000 RPM. This is going to be our 102 cutter. I'm taking a fairly conservative 0.045 inch depth per pass, 60 inch per minute feed rate, 50% step over. I'm leaving myself room to manually override my feed rates depending on how my Nomad cuts the wood that I'm using, which in this case I'm not going to know until after I scope out my garage to see what kind of scraps I have. I'm going to leave the machining margin at a positive value greater than the diameter of the tool and I'm going to add a couple thou of stock to leave. Export that and let's tackle finishing. A 1 16th inch ball end mill is the smallest tool I'm comfortable employing here. There are a couple areas where I'm not sure our standard 1 32nd inch end mill will be able to reach into without crashing its shoulder into a cliff for some other feature. If this is something you're going to want to do more often, consider investing in a tapered ball end mill which will provide better reach. Also note that for finishing, I'm going to set my machining margin to zero. I don't want this shorter tool draping over the edges of my part because that will for sure crash the shoulder of the tool into the model. My step over is about 0.1 millimeters. You can play around with this value to either speed things up or increase detail. Feed rate here is 70 inches per minute, but you could potentially go faster depending on what material you're machining. I personally like to run a second perpendicular pass at full speed, as I find the second pass cleans up a lot of the burrs and fuzz in my carvings, which will be annoying to clean up by hand. But depending on the size of your model, this may be time prohibitive. I'm usually multitasking in the office, so this isn't as big a deal as long as it finishes before I go home. Export your finishing toolpath and start making chips. One thing I want to point out is that as you cut away wood, it will often bow or warp. There are stresses in the grain of the wood that are being released, and you're also opening up the wood to differential drying if the moisture content in your wood isn't perfectly consistent before you start. If you don't trust your stock to stay flat and don't want to sand the back face of your piece back to flatness, you should leave a thicker base layer or glue it to a rigid substrate. Though I used a healthy amount of double-sided tape, it still wasn't enough to keep my stock perfectly flat, although it did stay in place during machining. To do a final cutout of your piece, you can just fire up Carbide Create, draw a rectangle of the appropriate size, and use a contour toolpath to cut out your topographic carving. Or you can just do it by hand. It's not a big deal. If your friends are the kind of people who will nitpick that your project faces are out of parallel by a tenth of a degree, let's be honest, they aren't worth keeping around. There will still likely be a couple small places that you'll have to touch up with sandpaper. Another option to clean up the fuzz if you have a lot of it is to use a fine wire brush or some scotch brite just to knock it off. Other than those words of advice, this is conceptually a very simple workflow, but something you'll probably still have to tailor to your own particular projects. Hope this video helped kickstart some project ideas, good luck, and have fun machining, folks.